getting some cookies. Uh, we had a laugh in anatomy. Somebody asked about virtual cookies, and I was like, well, those exist. You just don't necessarily want that, right, for this. Um, so please, those who are here, uh, take thirds. <laughs> We're going to get started. So we get through. I know this is a remarkably busy time for all. Those who don't know me, I think all of you I, I know, either joining us virtually or, or joining us in person. Um, I'm Dr. Rossi Katz. And another semester nearly done, another memorable semester nearly done. Um, thank you for joining us today to listen to your peers present on capstone projects, to celebrate your perseverance this semester, and a special congrats to our graduates who will uh, be celebrating a week from tomorrow. So among us in the virtual audience or face-to-face, -face, who will be graduating on Friday, next Friday. So, round of applause. Um, super proud of you all. Probably what I've come to learn most is you really never graduate from the SLHS department. We just have a new relationship in terms of will you come guest lecture? You're a graduate now. Can we put a student in terms of, of internships? So thank you um, for your dedication to this program. We are, uh, it's our privilege to be working with you all. Please keep in touch. Let us know in terms of a personal email. Um, we are here. We oftentimes get connections from alums and even just updates and that is some of the most heartwarming correspondence we get so that's all for me did we want to do the nishla thing at the end in capstones first let's do capstones first yeah, capstones first so with that i will let you now get our first presenter and we do have time for questions i think after each presentation yes so hi everyone, I'm Dr. Marsha walsh -Aziz. Um, So yes, the first three presenters uh, were in my section of the Senior Experience course where we did the Principles of Assessment and Intervention in content, um, but they did a project together um, which they'll describe sequentially in their, in their presentation. Dulce is going to be our first one. Dulce, I'm going to put your face up here and then I'm going to share have, do you want to share your screen or to do the PowerPoint or how do you want to do your PowerPoint? Um, how it is on the screen is fine or okay. will you see my face only or? Well, if I put your face up here, then we won't necessarily see the PowerPoint as well. It might work actually. Let me try something. Let me see how this looks. Okay. If I, I do... not share my screen. <laughs> I do this like we normally would. I just want to make sure people in the room can see you too. Um, we have the TV on order. It's yeah. just in shipping delay. <laughs> so next semester, there hopefully will be a monitor hanging here. Okay. So you, you all will be person. able yeah. be able to oh, see. Oh, well, look at her. Not only is she a cookie maker, <laughs> she is a tech wizard. <laughs> All right, so if I do this, I think if I share, so just, Dulce, you just kind of tell me how to how to move along with the okay. slides, and I'll be your assistant here, okay? Okay, thank you. Let me, I'm just setting up my watch here, one second. Okay, um, let me share this as well. There we go, perfect. Okay, I'll try and make sure that doesn't block you or anything, but it's all yours, Dulce. Okay, thank you. Um, so my name is Dulce and I will be sharing my service learning presentation. Next slide, please. Um, so here's an outline of what I will be talking about. I will briefly mention who I am, um, as well as the senior experience project um, that my classmates, Gian and Molly and I um, participated in. We also created um, 
our own adaptive books within this project. So um, I will talk about my adaptive book as well as um, some extension activities that I created for that book. Um, I will reflect on my project and my overall experience um, and um, I will answer questions at the end. Um, so like I mentioned, my name is Dulce Bocanegra. My pronouns are she, her, hers. Um, I was born and raised here in Colorado and I am a transfer student here at MSU Denver. I've been here for about two years. Um, so the senior experience project Gianna, Molly and I participated in was in collaboration with um, the Center for Inclusive Design and Engineering and uh, they provide assistive technology services for um, adults with adults and children with uh, physical disabilities, with complex communication needs, um, as well as um, learning and cognitive difficulties. Um, and they are located behind um, the MSU Denver Administration Building um, in a small brick building called Bioengineering. Um, <clears throat> and so our supervisor, her name is uh, Christina Perkins. She is a speech language pathologist who works there. Um, and we participated in a book club with two middle and high school age um, students who use AAC devices. Um, um, and this uh, book club was, it ran for about six weeks in person. Um, and uh, this was the first time a senior experience project um, collaborated with the Center for Inclusive Design and Engineering. Um, and so Gianna, Molly and I are very grateful to have been a part of this project. Um, so this is one aspect of uh, the project and uh, Gianna and Molly will expand more on different things that we did within this project. Um, so the adaptive book that I created was based off of The Giver um, and some common themes within that book included memory, color and choice. Um, the main protagonist of uh, The Giver is a 12 year old boy named Jonas um, and he lives in a society where they don't really have access to memory, color or choice up until he meets uh, this man called The Giver and then he is able to have access to um, memory, color, and choice. And so when I was creating my adaptive book, I wanted to create the distinction of uh, Jonas within his society and then Jonas when he was uh, with the giver. And so I um, added some black and white images um, uh, when prior to Jonas having met the giver, and then I added images uh, with color when uh, Jonas was uh, with the giver to uh, create that distinction of when color was present and when it wasn't. Um, and so I created uh, five extension activities to go along with my adaptive book. And um, these are two of the activities that I created. Um, the activity to the left is based off of uh, the theme of memory. And so the idea here is for a student to uh, click on one of these images. Um, they are all related to um, the theme of memory. And so um, stating something like Jonas received a memory of a sunburn. This memory is important because um, Jonas felt pain for the first time. So the idea is to kind of tie back why the theme of memory is important. Um, and then the activity to the right is a job application activity that I created. Um, in the giver, uh, the children of the society when they turn 12 years old are given permanent job assignments. Um, and so I thought it would be fun for students to um, fill out their own job application. And so this activity is uh, focused on prompting, so being very specific within the questions. Um, and then I also added images of different uh, job professions to help facilitate answering those questions. Um, and so uh, my reflection, I, 
I definitely learned the importance of accessibility through this project. Um, so although these students weren't reading a physical copy of the book we read within our book club, the access to the material was still the same. They were still able to um, read um, the book we read in our book club um, through um, an adaptive book format um, through the format of the PowerPoint presentation. Um, so the so the um, instruction was different, but the material was still the same. Um, and we also learned about different communication strategies. Um, one uh, communication strategy we learned about um, was descriptive teaching. Um, and so one example our supervisor taught us um, was using, um, for example, a tier three word such as TP and bringing it back down to a tier one word. Um, to say something like triangle house um, and keeping um, a, a vocabulary within their core, their core vocabulary. Um, and um, as far as leveling text, we also um, learned how to make our um, adaptive books nice and accessible by making sure the font size was nice and big and that um, there was enough spacing within sentences um, so that it was spread out and it looked cohesive and um, um it that our books were not cluttered um and so uh, moving on to my thoughts um i found that creating my own adaptive book was very fun i um it was a very time consuming process that i had not anticipated for it to be um however i i had a lot of fun creating my adaptive book I do want to say that creating my extension activities um, was very difficult for me um, just because I'm not I don't consider myself a creative person. And so I had a hard time trying to think of how to create fun activities that related back to the main themes of my book. Um, however, I do want to say that this was a very gratifying experience because um, I was able to have a firsthand experience of how um, different communication strategies um, helped facilitate access to language uh, for these students. Um, and thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions? Any questions? And just as a if you have any questions about the book club, please wait until after Molly's presentation because then you'll have like all of the information. But any questions at all on Dulce's project and working. I have a question. Dulce, this is Dr. Rossi Katz. Just where, oh, how do you think you'll apply what you learned in this experience for what's next for you? What will you take away? Sure, yeah. Um, so I definitely want to continue um, pursuing um, a career with children once I graduate. Um, I currently work with children in my part-time job. Um, and so I feel that learning about the different communication strategies such as descriptive teaching and partnered assistive scanning um, will help me make sure to be inclusive to all students. Um, and um, because although, um, like I mentioned, although um, the instruction of how um, lessons uh, may be different, um, the material will still be the same. And so it's important to think about how to be inclusive to all students. Hey, thanks. Thank you. Uh, oh, Cindy? I love how you chose a common book for that age group and brought it to a group that normally would not be able to read it. And I think that just, that's, that's just really <laughs> to see that you did that. Thank you. Um, so I have a question. I know you said you don't think of yourself as a creative person. Um, when you were choosing like the images and things for your extension activities, what are some like specific things you thought about including or intentionally didn't include? Can you just talk a little bit more about how you made those choices? Sure. Um, so um, like I stated, the the main themes of the giver um, relate back to um, the themes of memory, color, and choice. And so, you know, I thought about doing something like a scavenger hunt, but I 
I just really kept, um, I just really tried to think about what the message of the giver was and how I could relate that to my activity. So, um, for example, like my um, job application activity that relates back to the giver in the sense that, you know, um, in in a couple chapters, the mention of uh, how the children of the society um, are given uh, permanent job assignments could relate back to the activity um, by creating a job application. Um, another activity that I created was um, around emotion. Emotion was a very strong theme in the book. And so I thought, you know, um, providing different emoji clip arts of um, different emotions was would um, allow these students allow these students to kind of tie back um, the main themes of the book. So just really, um, I created the um, the activities based off of the main themes of the book. Um, and um, I, I just had a very hard time with that because I just, I wanted to make the activities fun, but I just, it was hard to think of, you know, activities, for example, like a job application. All right, thank you very much, Dulce. And next we'll have uh, Gianna, I believe, yeah? Yes. Come on up. Uh, do you want me to run the PowerPoint or do you want to run it? Okay. okay. I'll just get you started here so we can also see these people over here. All yours. All right, I'm Gianna, and this is my service learning project. You might have to use the arrow. Or click on it. Um, okay, so I'm going to go over my portion of the book club, my book adaptation and my process, the comprehension activities and the importance of them and how they complement my book adaptation, and then the creation of those comprehension activities, my overall impressions, and then we'll open to any questions. So the book club included myself, Molly, Dulce, Chris, who Dulce mentioned, and then two additional middle and high school students, plus one mentor. And so the two students and the mentor used alternative augmentative communication devices. And it was very interesting to become aware of how large the spectrum of abilities really is. And in terms of the type of AAC devices, Molly will dive more into that. <coughs> Within this book club, we learned how to appropriately adapt the chapter book called City of Ember. And what I mean by adapt is we summarize each chapter and then we added in certain words that contributed to the larger ideas of that chapter. So adapting books is very important for students who use AAC devices. They can still access material that teaches them about literacy and so they get a feel for what rich vocabulary sounds like being used in the context of a book. Each week, Molly, Jose, and myself would adapt a few chapters just to get a feel for what the process was like so we could eventually do it on a chapter book of our own. And then each book club meeting, we would review previous chapters that we read in other meetings, and then we would read the three or so chapters that we adapted for that meeting. And then at the end, we would make predictions on what we thought was going to happen for our next meeting. So I chose to do the book around the world in 80 days. The first thing that was suggested for us to do was read the book cover to cover to get a grasp on the main ideas. And then after this, I created a PowerPoint, similarly like the one we did in the book club. And then I would, and then I would go chapter by chapter, and I pulled out the main idea from each, so then I could summarize it for my PowerPoint. So I definitely underestimated the process. I, um, you know, making harder concepts more comprehensible is a skill in itself. And so making it simple while not leaving too much information out was actually the hardest part. So again, my prioritizing. So after I got my initial thoughts down for each chapter, I went back probably three to four times to continuously change, add in, take out unnecessary parts that either didn't support the main ideas or were not relevant to teaching core vocabulary. Um, I also added in vocabulary that might be more recognizable for the students, so I would change like tavern to restaurant. Um, many of the descriptor words I was able to remove as well, like adjectives, 
they're not necessarily needed for teaching core vocabulary. And core vocabulary are words like need, want, yes, no. And then I also changed the character names so that they were easier to pronounce and kind of understand, like Billings dog to dog. Um, so after I went through and finished adding or deleting parts of each chapter, we learned that students who have complex disabilities or who use AAC devices work really well with pictures for comprehension purposes. So I added in at least one to each of my slides. Um, they work really well with contrast, so hence the white background and the dark lettering. And then really good with white space too, so I made sure I added a good chunk in between my paragraphs for each slide as well. And then the font was a really big deal. Can't see it there, but I changed the anything to the anything right here because that G is a little bit more of a universal <coughs> that you would see in other places. Um, so the comprehension activities, book adaptations are important for students who are nonverbal or students who use AAC devices. So they can still access and get exposed to printed text and vocabulary used in a story. Um, students can also become familiar with the process of how stories develop too. So these are things like evolution of characters, conflicts, resolutions, um, recognizing that stories have a beginning, middle, and end. And so then comprehension activities are important to incorporate so that the students can get exposed to tier two and tier three vocabulary words, but more importantly, so they can get comfortable using <coughs> tier one words. So tier one words, again, are the most frequently used in our everyday language. Tier two are a little bit more complex, but are easily transferable between different topics. And then tier three are less frequent words and they're more specific to certain topics. The creation of my comprehension activities so after the adaptation process was complete, I pulled out some main ideas of the book that I listed here. So robbery, wagers, competition, transportation, and then some cultural aspects as well. The topic I chose to focus on was the idea of travel and transportation, just because there's lots of ways to branch off of this topic and make it relevant to the student's life. So I used an application called Jamboards to create an interactive game. So the concept I came up with for, was for the students to plan each trip. So first I have them pick a mode of transportation. Here I wanted to highlight the importance of the word need, because again, that's one of those tier one vocabulary words and something that nonverbal students should be really comfortable using. So whether or not they would need a boat or an airplane to fly across the ocean, depending on where they would pick to go in their destination, or um, specifically saying whether they need a passport maybe. So again, through this class, we learned that students also require different supports. So I included pictures and words. However, you could actually use legit objects or a legit map if that's what that student required. So here again, the students are able to use these carrier phrases, which are also known as predictable chart writing, or yeah, predictable chart writing. And then these uh, help the students learn the actual structure of speech and language. So I'm traveling by a bus, I'm getting in a car, etc. And then I created another activity within this, within my larger activity, that would work on the word preposition, or that would work on prepositions, specifically the word in, which is another one of those tier one vocabulary words or core vocabulary. So they can actually like drag, like click and drag and put them in their suitcase. So I will put my shoes in the suitcase. I will put my toothbrush in the suitcase again, like recognizing that you can actually do the motion in relation to the word. So my overall impressions, the book adaptation or this assignment in general really allowed us to be creative and flexible as well as the book club is too. Um, if I were to do this again, I would know how to manage my time more efficiently just because it was a process and now I know what is necessary and what's not. So I wouldn't have to go back and keep revising and revising. Um, however, it was very enjoyable and I learned a lot. Any questions? Yeah, I have a question because I know you're interested in audiology. Yeah. How do you think the skills you learned in this are applicable to audiology? Because I think sometimes students go like, oh, I'm not going to need that for audiology. What What are some of the takeaways? I think that I mean, for like my specific comprehension activity, 
I could do things like practice detection. Mm -hmm. Like you could say, like testing whether like the child can hear you or mm -hmm. not, just by going mm -hmm. through all these different types of things. So like, that could be a good application. Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't know who presented their book first for the book club, but like, did the people that preceded them take stuff away and re kind of evaluate what they were going to present based on like the failures or success of the first presentation and activities? Um, you mean like Dulce's? So repeat the question. Oh, I just I don't know who went first. So in the oh, book club, okay. I would imagine you all took turns with which. Oh order you presented and yeah. what lessons did you learn from the people that presented before or after you? Yeah, um, we actually, so we didn't share these books in the book club. We did this after. Gotcha. We learned how to kind of adapt and find what was necessary for the book that we actually ran the book club with. Gotcha. And then after we were able to reflect on that process and then create our own gotcha. creations and stuff. Yeah. Uh, how did you choose your book? Like, were there parameters? Had you, had you read that book before? Um, actually, Chris, our supervisor, just gave us three options. Okay. <laughs> I said I chose it, but like, not really. <laughs> Out of the choice is three. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm just curious, in a real world school environment, how would places have access? I mean, teachers don't have time to do this, so SLPs you would think would do some of this adapting for AAC users, but how do they get access to something like this? Because I have never seen anybody do it at all. Yeah, um, Molly's actually going to dive into where you can find all the resources, okay. but okay. there is a place yeah. where, yes, we like, where they upload these things. And then you can you to them. send it to different teacher, I mean districts? Could you guys kind of, I don't want to say market it, because I know there's other things out there, there's News U and a lot of other mm -hmm. things, but not books that are meaningful to that age group. Young adult. You know, this is, these are meaningful to that age group because everybody else is reading them. Mm -hmm. um, also, to the Center of Inclusive Design and Engineering, they have all those resources too, so I'm sure that we can give them, or give you that information too, and their office is there for those resources too. Mm -hmm. So is the point of the adaptation, do you give it to them along with the actual book, or is this just their new book? This is their book. Okay. Yeah, this is Mm -hmm. All right, great. Thank you so much. It's wonderful job. Not a competition. Everyone's doing great. Alright, so I've got you started here. Okay. You can use the arrows too. Perfect. Okay. Hi guys, my name is Molly, and this will be Monster Service Learning Project presentation. <coughs> um, so like everyone else, here's a quick outline. I'll, I'll quickly introduce myself, talk about the book club, the project, how to access um, these types of activities. I'll talk about my project. I'll kind of reflect on the good and the bad of all of this, and then questions overall. Okay, so my name is Molly Ditches. I grew up here in Denver, Colorado, and I am a transfer student. I think I've been here about three years, maybe less, something along those lines. Um, okay, so the book club. Uh, Dulce and John had talked a lot about the Center for Inclusive Design and Engineering, where Chris. Um, Perkins was the one who spearheaded our whole book club project. And from her, we learned a whole lot about the Center for Inclusive Design and from um, their other website, which is SWAC, so the Statewide Assistive Technology Augmentative and Alternative Communication. So this is that website that you would be able to go to <coughs> to get access to adapted books and comprehension or extension activities. There's lots of um, different books that you can research, different um, resources for SLPs to work with these bigger books that typically developing students may read in school and how to use it with um, children with uh, communication, complex communication problems and AAC users. 
Um, so the purpose of the book club and AAC, so we were there to help support those students in their discussions. And um, our two students that we had used different types of communication. We have one who used partner-assisted scanning, which would be considered low-tech um, AAC. So we would create like a list. We have our question and then create like three or four types of answers that um, he could choose from. And then what this person did, he would kind of look in a certain direction for his yes or for his no. So we'd read it out and we'd say, okay, we're gonna read him again and do it slowly so that we could give him time to process what we were saying and, um, and make his decision. The other person in the group, she used a lot of like text to voice. So she'd type out her answer and then her phone would read out what she wanted to say. Um, she ultimately ended up just texting Chris Chris was nice enough to give her her cell phone number, <laughs> and so she would text Chris her answers, and Chris would um, read them out loud for us. There was one or two occasions where she didn't have her phone with her, so we had to use a letter board, and I know there are um, high-tech options for that. We didn't have one of those. We used low-tech, and Chris wrote the alphabet out, and this girl just spelled it out for us. So that worked. It, it worked out really well. Um, like Gianna and Dulce talked about, we, in our book club, we did the City of Ember. Um, we adapted the book, we had discussions, and that was our introduction to the adaptation process. Um, my book was uh, Hatchet by Gary Paulson. I had never heard of this book before, you guys. So I had to read the whole thing <laughs> to understand what it was about. Um, and so then basically what you know, I had to do that to summarize all the points. And these books have a lot of detail in them and, and things that us as, you know, typically developing individuals with, you know, normal literacy development would understand, you know, what these things mean. And so finding a way to um, summarize it in a way that I could put enough detail in so that these these students would be able to understand what the whole point was, but not put too much detail into where they're like, I don't know what that means. Um, and creating the presentation, you know, uh, Dulce had mentioned the type of font and the size of the font is really important in these presentations. Um, having the white space in to not make the presentation seem so cluttered is really important for their understanding and comprehension as well. And uh, John had mentioned tier one, tier two, and tier three words. So for this, for my presentation, uh, or for my book and for Gianna and Dulce's, we were told that we needed to kind of highlight some like tier two and tier three words to give these students like exposure to them. And what I ended up doing in mine is, here's a couple of, exa of examples. So I had, uh, highlighted words like two or three in each summary of the chapter and I would try really hard to find pictures that would accompany those words so that they would kind of understand what that meant. These, these pictures would be able to help them see like oh that's what that means. You know so secrets they might not know what a secret is so don't tell anyone that kind of thing. Um, so that was a big part of our adaptations. And for my comprehension and extension um, project, the whole point of the book was that this boy gets lost in the woods. He finds a survival pack. So one of my activities was to create your own survival pack. So I used lots of pictures. You know, what would you need to survive if, if you got lost in the woods? You know, a sleeping bag, a flashlight, a tent, food, water, you know, first aid kit, that was a big point in the book as well. And my idea was that maybe, you know, if you're in a face-to-face uh, -face group, is that you could create them together, you know, bring in different objects and put them in a backpack. And that's, you know, this is what our survival pack would look like. Um, I did also a more of like a discussion group to kind of help with their comprehension of the book. 
So what were some things that Brian needed in the woods after we had gone through this book? What, what did he need? What did he need to survive? Um, this one was kind of fun because um, I had in mind that like you could build a fort with the kids and kind of show them like this is what a, a shelter would kind of look like. And I gave pictures of what um, the main character, Brian, would have ultimately had if he had wood, if he had dirt, and and sticks and stuff like that. So to kind of give them an idea of what that would be like. Um, and then my last activity that I created was to kind of talk to them about the difference between being stranded in the woods versus the desert. These kids probably don't know what these what your environment is like. So to kind of come up with ways to discuss it with them and to let them picture what it would what it would be like I thought would be kind of fun kind of fun okay so all the good and bad I going into this had no experience working with anybody who used AACs before so this was the first I had no idea what the Center for Inclusive Design and Engineering was I had no idea what SWAC was and as somebody who you know is ultimately going to go forward as an SLP having these resources was incredible. I mean, I, you know, the website shows different um, adapted books and learning, um, different learning tools and teaching tools would be very beneficial. I'm not strong in summarizing. <laughs> that took me a really long time to understand how to summarize it in a way that, um, was developmentally appropriate for these students. And one of the things I had found was I had a hard time doing it because this was for like an imaginary audience. I didn't know what the skill level was of these students I would be presenting to. So creating it so that it wasn't like a two-year-old reading a book, you know, someone who has more literacy experience but not someone who is in the 12th grade reading this book. Um, so kind of finding a, a middle part, that was really difficult, but once I kind of got my groove, it was, it was easier. Um, and this will all be, you know, like I said, this was very helpful for me to learn about um, the different abilities of people with AACs. You know, in our group we had kind of the whole spectrum. We had someone who had high tech who was very capable and um, very fluent with the use of his AAC. We had one who had very low communication abilities, so working really hard to communicate with him was new. And then someone who was kind of in the middle. So we kind of got a whole spectrum of, you know, different abilities of people who use AACs. And I'm very curious to see what I'll end up getting to work with in the future. But these all really helped. And <laughs> So that's, I think that's really great that you were able to work with people that had such a spectrum of ability. Mm -hmm. What did you find to be the most challenging part of working with these students with complex communication needs? Um, the first thing that I wasn't prepared for was the wait time in responses. I mean, we get automatic feedback right away I work with little children, so in a way it was similar waiting for them to kind of tell me like what they wanted to say. Um, that was something that was challenging at first was there was a lot of, in the first like two meetings, there was a lot of like, awkward silence where we were just waiting for, you know, someone to say something. Uh, but then once we kind of got used to it, we could, um, the silences were a little bit easier and, and it didn't feel as awkward. Um, and I want to invite Gianna if you want to share your experiences too. Yeah. Now that we're talking about like the whole group, if you want to yes. share what your um, challenges. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I'd have to agree with Molly because I had walked into this honestly kind of uncomfortable. I think at first just because I was not used to any of this, but I think wait time was a huge thing. I'd have to agree. And even Chris said too that that was something that 
you have to learn how to just mm -hmm. deal with and work with, not even deal with, but just learn how to respond. It's not, it's not you. They just also might not be in the mood that day. And then to honor mm -hmm. that and respect that, that boundary was really crucial too. Mm -hmm. um, did either of you all find yourself having to like ad adapt your extension activities because every kid's different? Like not do it exactly how you had it laid out? Yeah, I, I mean, so like this, these projects or these extension activities, since they were for a hypothetical group, we didn't get to really mm -hmm. uh, practice them with, with other people. But I could, I could see that. And I, I mean, I tried to think of ways that were interactive because that was something we did um, in our book club, actually, which I totally forgot until now, was in the city of Ember, they, they live in darkness. So we turned out all the lights. We had one flashlight candle, you know, kind of things like that, um, like more interactive activities, so that was kind of helpful to base my extension activities on, but yeah, I'm sure that it could be, you know, these activities could be changed based on the needs um, and abilities of the kids. So the, the City of Ember book, was that from that SWAC site like was that one of the um adaptations that that was from there like did you get the activities from that no, site that, or? Was, that was the book we did in our book club with with chris perkins she did so she Facebook. did and so did she create the activities for that like where did where did your i guess where did the adaptation come from for that book um it really kind of us, us. <laughs> so, you, so you guys Kind of did too. Like you did that first as yeah, a group, like, and then you each did your own individually. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah she, she okay. did the first few chapters. Yeah, okay. yeah, she did the first couple chapters, and then she sent us the spark notes because we wouldn't have had time to read the whole book in time for the rest of the the meetings. So she sent us the spark notes, and then we had to summarize the spark notes into a into an adaptation. Yeah. So I guess my answer would be she did. Okay. <laughs> she created the activity. Sure. Do you think a book like *The City of Ember* was a little bit harder because there's a little bit more like symbolism rather than like patch it, where it's like in your hands you can say, "Oh, we're gonna pack this," whereas opposed to *City of Ember*, it's more like they're living underground; they don't really have mm -hmm. anything. Yeah, I, I feel like that was probably harder to simulate. I mean, we could do it where we turned out all the lights, and then the light was only from the, the presentation, or we talked about opening gifts or something like that so we stuff tissue in a, in a bag and tear it open and yeah but i think there are some books where there's more symbolism that might be harder to create like hands-on activities for them to i don't know what did you think John? i think we did a lot of activities that we related to their lives more so like where, where it was a time that it was all dark for you mm -hmm. And then they could be like, oh, yeah, when the lights went out at my house and then like related to their, their life. So we did a lot more of that than like actual tangible things. I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. did, okay. I was just going to ask if you guys found it challenging as you were working on the city of Ember one, knowing that you had a broad range of abilities to like tailor the activities for all of the participants. Or did you like try to create one activity that would be at one level and one that would be at another? I personally had an easier time because I do better when I have like some kind of example or some like reference to go off of. So knowing what those abilities were in those students helped me. Like this was much harder. I mean, like I said, it's for a hypothetical group. So I don't know how much to scale back, how much to add in. Um, but that was my we kept a lot of the, uh, the activities the same every time too so like we had these i wonder statements or um I don't know what else we have. A, a dream of mine and like going based off of yeah 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 mm -hmm. like based off of the chapters that we read that meeting we would just talk about like i wonder what would happen next like we just kind of kept it My question was for all of the three of you. When you went in, uh, when you first met these two students, um, what what were your impressions of them initially, and how did that change at the end? Did that 
were, were you thinking of what their abilities were before when you first met them and and did your impression of what their abilities were change? I don't, I didn't know what to expect going in. I mean, like I said before, I have never had experience working with um, people who use AACs. So I think that helped me in a way like not create expectations that I kind of just went into it like, see how it goes kind of thing. Um, but I was very surprised at all of their abilities. I think in the back of my mind, I kind of kept the notion of like, okay, they use ADCs, like they may not have, you know, very good communication skills with or without ADCs and that they would need a lot of help. Mm -hmm. But by the end, I mean, we learned that like one of, like one of the guys, like he's actually really funny, like when he could like get out all his like thoughts and, and everything was, but there, there was just more mm -hmm. than what I kind of expected in the back of my head without nice. not expecting it. That's amazing. Yeah. I think just because they can't express like verbally, that doesn't mean necessarily they don't have a lot going on and like a lot they want to say. And then I was able to actually see that at the end, like their personalities were really coming through. And I think that's really awesome to see. Because at first, like even taking Dr. Marshall's Foundations of Disability Studies, you think you have to like help them in some sort of way, but you really don't. You just need to provide a more accessible way for these things, but you don't actually need to like, help them move their chair, or, like do anything like that. Like they can do that. You're just there for for that like one-on-one -on -one connection that isn't therapy, that was just a fun thing to do mm -hmm. at the end of the day. So nice. Bill nice. did you want to say something? Yeah, um, similar to what Molly and Gianna said. Um, my personal experience, I felt very nervous just because I had never had experience working with uh, children with disabilities um, and, um, you know, specifically children who use AAC devices. I, I was, it was, it was good that we were able to um, participate with Chris during this book club um, and she did a phenomenal job of really guiding each session and so we within each meeting we were kind of able to see you know we don't have to walk on eggshells when interacting with um, these students and um, like how Molly had mentioned wait time is very important and so um, you know just waiting for their responses um, it, it was just very I think a very eye-opening experience and a very rewarding experience for all three of us. Nice. Uh, Joanne, I see your hand up. That's Joe jo Bailey from the Dean's Office. Oh, Joe Bailey. Hi, sorry. Hi. Hi, how are you? Oh, it looks like I might be a little delayed here. I just want to say I'm so impressed with all of you. You've done such a great job. And I, I don't know enough about your discipline, but it's clear that you um, have received a lot and given a lot to a team approach. And you're extraordinarily um, sensitive and appropriate in a cultural manner. And I'm wondering, do you get that in the classroom? Did you, do you have those conversations or did you come in with this? That's all. I feel like there's only so much you can learn like in the class, like, for sure. you know, with this year's with AACs, like we've been taught about them. We've kind of been showed like pictures of them and, but like, getting to use them hands-on was very different. So part of it is like, learn as you go. <laughs> mm -hmm. I don't know, I that was just kind of my view on it. <laughs> I don't know. Um, for me personally, um, I consider myself a very, um, you know, I, I like to respect people just in general. I think that's something and anyone and everyone should do. And so, you know, when I think of uh, people with disabilities, I, um, you know, something I learned in uh, one of my speech classes uh, is that having a disability isn't a special need. And so um, <laughs> one deserves to have um, the same respect. And so when I 
um, went into this um, into the first meeting for the book club, I wanted to make sure that I was not only polite but respectful um, to these children because at the end of the day, um, we all deserve that and we're all human. Um, so not treating them as um, other or less than was very important for me. I think like if we go into this profession, we already are like those types of people maybe that just are like aware of what's around us and just, yeah, how to treat people nicely. I think we all did a really good job and it, it wasn't like we, like there was three of us, including Chris, and then just a couple of students who who did have disabilities. And I don't think that we overpowered them in any way either. I think that it was definitely a collaboration between all of us. And we were really good at including each other, you know, whether in the absence of disability or not. So I think that we did a really good job. <laughs> awesome. um, Becky, I see your hand up. Just real quick, I, and you know, and I was texting Dr. Rossi Katz at the beginning of this. I just I just want to thank you for sharing this and sharing and thank you for doing all this hard work. Um, I'm always so impressed with our with our students and what what they do. And this is such an amazing department and it's very important. And I just want to make sure that everybody understands how important all of this work is. And from an external perspective, how important this is to our external partners and our uh, the agents that we work with and donors and all of this. You are recognized as, as a an amazing department and a, an amazing set of students. I just want to say that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Yeah, thank you. All right. Thank you all. Wonderful job. Um, next up, we have Irene, I believe. And let me pull up your, I just downloaded it for you. Oh, <laughs> 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 Hi you guys. Um, so I was lucky enough to have the first one gone on to myself. Um, for my Tesla project, it was a really cool experience just to be able to talk to her and get to know her. So thank you for that. Um, so this is just my reflection on my um, SLH. Um, so each week or every other week, um, she would give me readings or videos to watch. Um, and these were just my three favorite ones that I got out of this whole semester. Um, the first one was a YouTube video on women with autism. Um, and it was interesting to see that a lot of times um, women are definitely underdiagnosed compared to men. And then a lot of times they're diagnosed like 20, 30, or even 40 years old. So almost half of their life. Um, the second one was an article actually done by Professor Santana and a colleague, um, and it was an adult's perspective on social communication and invention, um, and then the results. Um, at the end, it was super interesting to see that like many adults with autism don't feel that the intervention that they had when they were younger benefited them as much as most people think that they do. Um, it's super interesting because, I mean, I worked with kids and things like that and I I felt like I impacted them and it's come to find out like in the features like they don't really feel it <laughs> we didn't have much of an impact it's like you know give me a different perspective um the second thing that they actually wanted was more real work practice a lot of the times um intervention is just one on one very generic um and it's more of like the SLP or that um um, that adult speaking down to them. So it's not like on an equal platform. Um, and so being able to like, help with their own intervention was something that um, was really asked for. And then the last one was just having more neurotypical understanding. So us being able to understand that um, they're, they're equal to us, you know, they're not below us. And um, I thought that was really impactful to me. Um, and then the last one was another article. Um, on double empathy. Um, a lot of times, us as individuals think that the autistic people is the problem, you know, like when we're conversating with them, um, we feel that because they're different um, and they, they're they the reason that we can't communicate with them. Um, when in reality, it's both parties trying to figure out what they need, um, 
in terms of communication. And so being understanding of that, and being more willing to just add a little more effort is super important. Um, so yeah, it's a mutual challenge and we should just be more willing to be patient and understand. Um, so every week, um, Professor Sumba and I would um, meet with some students on the autism spectrum um, and we would just hang out and talk, you know, like talk about our interests and stuff. Um, some impressive things that I've learned from them. Um, one student actually spoke on a TED talk, um, which is super impressive because I can barely speak to you guys about how much time you're like sweating programmably. So like to have somebody speak in front of hundreds of people was super amazing. Um, another student shared that he is going to go on a study abroad to Japan, which is super cool and not something that I would have thought that an autistic adult would do or want to do, you know? Um, so to see that was super cool. Um, and then my peer support actually mentioned that she went on the 100 pound weight loss journey, which is incredible because that perseverance and the, you know, mental toughness that you need to do that is really hard. <laughs> um, so if I'm being honest, I did not realize that the Isaac program was like a form of intervention until like maybe a week or two ago. Remember, <laughs> 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 like someone just like mentioned it like all kind of me. I was like, oh, you know, like yeah, this is this is what this is. Um, but I thought that was super cool, you know, that I didn't even realize it and that it focused more on like engagement and their strengths instead of their faults and things like that. So it was more of just like a practice platform for us to engage and talk and um, get to know each other, which is super cool. Um, and I definitely learned more from them than like they did from me. I, I, I don't know, I mostly just sat there and like asked questions instead of answering them. So I thought that was super cool. <laughs> um, so at the beginning of the semester, Professor Santana asked me if I would be a peer support. Um, and I like that she made it peer support and not mentor because it put us on the same platform. You know, it's not me speaking down to her and um, helping her, you know, it is the mutual understanding of support and respect. Um, but meeting for the first time was really awkward and lasted like maybe 10 to 15 minutes because you know, we had that double empathy problem where we weren't sure how to communicate with each other. Um, but then as I got to know her, I realized how amazing she is. She has a ton of accomplishments. Um, she has that 100 weight pound loss. She actually has a blog where she posts healthy foods and um, just things for like mental health support and things like that. Um, and she has just accomplished so many things throughout her life. She's a little older than I am um, and has been on her own since she was 18 years old. And to see her be where she is without any support is amazing because I wouldn't be where I am without my parents, you know, mentors and things like that. So the fact that she has been able to do that by herself has been super cool and interesting to learn. Um, so it definitely went from like a peer support to friends. Um, <laughs> I offhandedly mentioned that we should go to a movie or go out to eat sometime, you know, and you know, like half the time it's just like, yeah, we'll do it. And then it never ends up happening. Um, but she took me up on it and we went and watched the movie and had a great time and ended up just having a whole, like hour long conversation afterwards, you know, it's it's been amazing to be able to make a new friend um, just from you know having having to be a peer support at the beginning. You know, it was super cool to to meet her and just I don't know. I feel like I'll be able to talk to her for the rest of my life. It'll be cool. So looking into the future, um, <laughs> <laughs> Looking into the future, I've definitely gained a different perspective on autistic adults. Um, I, it's kind of hard to like express how much I've learned. You know, I, I, I feel like I have opened up a whole new light of just like friends and um, just information that I didn't have and I wouldn't have had if I had not gone to um, had this experience with Professor Santana. Um, and <laughs> obviously through intervention ideas that don't obviously have to be so forced and so generic, just can be, you know, one-on-one -on -one conversations or a group conversation and still be um, very successful. So, questions? Mm -hmm. So you mentioned that 
you didn't feel like you didn't realize that the Isaac group was intervention until recently. Yes. Do the autistic individuals in the group think of it as intervention or like how do they sort of they have specifically said that they just like being here and being able to have some support system. I mean, I don't think that they look at it as an intervention at all. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's just mm -hmm. more of a platform for them really to um, be open and honest and just talk about how they're feeling and things like that. And I think just the intervention part is second to, to what's actually happening. Were any of them able to share their past experiences with intervention? Like, did they align with that article you read? Or did um, you not talk about that? Interesting. Did anyone else have any questions? I think it's amazing how this entire, like these three presentation or four presentations, you can really see how you guys have taken this, you're next to them, you're not above in doing intervention or peer groups or anything you're you're equal and you're you're viewing yourselves as equal which i think is so important because so many times therapists come in and they are just going to fix things mm -hmm. and you guys are taking a really amazing approach and it's really cool for me to see it actually gives me goosebumps it's really cool <laughs> <laughs> yes uh, do you have any thoughts on like how you talk about intervention ideas um, on how you might apply those uh, like children with autism or are you mostly thinking about like working with adults with autism and you think about different intervention ideas? I mean, I think it kind of goes hand in hand with children as well, just because I mean, when we're children, a lot of the times when we're learning, it's based off of like our friends and the people that we're around. So I definitely think it could be used for children. Um, it, I'm, I'm not a missile piece, so I don't actually know, you know? But I definitely think it would be like something useful to think for in terms of that. You're almost an SLP. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> how did, I'm just curious how she, um, uh, she, right? Yeah. Uh, reached out to you to interact outside of the Isaac group, like, and how you see that moving forward. Um, so I actually asked for her number at the very beginning. I was trying to find something that we could relate to. And so one of the things that we both have interest in is watching anime. Uh -huh. um, and so I just told her, like, text me your favorite anime shows, you know, just <laughs> so I can watch them. Um, and so she just texted me. Like, she had my number. And uh, Joe, I just wanted to say that you're coming too. Like, even if it is a child, they're part of a system. You know, so it's also working with families mm -hmm. or if you're working with older adults, working with the adult children. So I think, you know, so many of these skills, just Cindy to pick up on, on your comment, which is much appreciated is like, this is such a time for there's so much information and information transfer, but it's all put into like a larger tapestry of human engagement and human interaction. And you know, kind of honoring where people are coming from um, in doing that. So it's so cool. I agree, Cindy, just to see the ways in which you all have this content knowledge, but that you've threaded it into like a humanistic uh, uh, just engagement with it. And I don't think that can be totally taught, but you all have it and it was fostered. And it's just so incredible to witness it. Um, so thank you. For your peer support, um, was it you just had one person? Like, mm -hmm. um, okay. Yeah. So then I guess my question would be, do you think it would be different if you had like two, um, two other peers instead of just like the one girl that you interacted with more? Or like how would you do it differently? I think as long as we can find common interests, I, I don't think it would have made that much of a difference. Honestly, I, I think I would have been just about the same. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm just curious. Yeah. I just wanted to share what you shared with me yesterday. We were practicing and um, Irene was saying, I was asking her what really broke the ice there. You know, in the beginning it was awkward and then it was uncomfortable. How did you get to this point of going for a movie together? Like, what did you do? 
And she said that we, we started with that shared interest. Mm -hmm. And that's what really built and not, you know, talking to her peer person as someone who was a therapist who was showing her or modeling, this is how you need to ask questions. This is how you need to interact. This is how you need to engage. You know, she didn't do any of that. She was just, she just stayed herself and the peer person just was herself and yeah, it worked really well. I would be really curious to see something like this done with your non-speaking group, your book club mm -hmm. people, mm -hmm. which would be amazing. Mm -hmm. yeah. I have a volunteer if somebody yeah. wants to be <laughs> I have somebody that would love to have a pair. <laughs> I mean, do you think you would have done it differently if you had known from the start that it was intervention? I think... I mean, I would have had a different like mindset, definitely. Um, so to like just figure it out at the end was like, oh, cool, I could do this too. And I'm like, I don't really think if you did like this too, it was super. I felt like I'm glad it happened that way. And they didn't know that she was not autistic. They, I don't think anybody knew. Towards the very end, she mentioned during a session. And there were a couple of head nods acknowledging. I think we kind of knew there were some <laughs> expressions like that, but nobody knew. And that's why, um, and it was not intentional. It was not like we were trying to hide or anything. Um, but it just never came up. Like nobody spoke about their autistic identity or not being autistic or anything like that. And at the beginning, too, like our progression in the Isaac program was definitely different, too. Like I think it took a little warming up. To everybody to for everybody to like open up but once we started like towards the middle and the end i mean i feel like so many students were talking way more than they had before mm -hmm. so it was super cool to like see that progression Actually, to go off of that, I know that it like, takes a while to be able to open up and build those kinds of relationships because we only had six weeks, which is enough time, but I feel like we could have even had more like towards the end we were like just getting comfortable because we had this like party and it was really cute and stuff but like did you do it the whole semester yeah oh you did okay yeah okay. yeah um but yeah i mean it was super cool to just see that progression i didn't even realize it too until for this mm -hmm. i was like yeah he's talking way more and i was like oh well, yeah like he is and I was like, <laughs> <laughs> those things just didn't click i guess <laughs> and we're Fortunate, although Dr. Santanam will be focused on some other things for the beginning <laughs> of the spring semester, um, we were able to recruit an incredible clinician who I've worked with in the past and taught here years ago to keep the group going. Um, so it is an option. And if interested, reach out to me um, and Professor Olaf, and we can get you connected with that. We're also keeping the book club going for senior experience. It'll probably be more just the adaptive part. I don't know that we'll actually have the actual book club. That was the first time where they had like people meeting. Oh. But they want to keep this library going of yeah. these adaptive books. So yeah. um, we want to recruit, or we, we will have students working on making more adaptive books for the CIDE. So that way that library can keep building. Um, I think we have a one video, right, um, Dr. Santanam? Is all that we have left? Is that, or did you want to? Yeah, I mean, it's been 50 books for an hour. Okay. So if folks yeah. have to go, we can also share out the link. Yeah. Right? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah let's, let's do the think. announcement. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then yeah. you can send the link if need be too. That sounds good. Um, Nesla wants to announce what happening with the board members and maybe anything about next semester at all? Oh, I can look here for the camera. Hi guys, I'm Audrey, I'm the Vice President of Minnesota, and I'm super excited. We have um, so Taylor is going to, unfortunately, they said be here today, but Taylor is going to be the new president of Michela. She's amazing. She is a junior. Um, she is super excited. And then we also have Sarah, who's going to be our treasurer, who also could make it today. But they are both uh, juniors and super excited to be in Michela. And we are super excited for next semester. 
And you're going to be continuing as? I'm going to be continuing as the vice president, and then Jackie will continue as secretary. Okay. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Awesome. And yeah, any, any plans for this event next semester? Or we're still working on We're details. still working on this. Good. Good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Be on the lookout. Uh, yes, yes. <laughs> we, we are, our goal is to, uh, yes, to have a meeting start, like, as soon as we get back in January. So expect to come to Initialist's first meeting in January, as soon as the date comes out. Great. <laughs> Thank you, Audrey. Thank you, Audrey. Um, do we want to play the video? We can. Yeah, I want to say. Yeah. Feel and, free to leave. Yeah. If yep. folks online, um, you please stay if you can. There was a short, one more short video, but I also know your very busy days, so thank you for joining us. And then folks are here, you can get another cookie. Yes. <laughs> three or three. Uh, Tracy says, well done presenters. It's great to hear from you. It's an amazing semester. Also doing the same thing. Wonderful to see all the good work. I'm going to do the best to you all. I'm going to go here and make sure we've got sound on. Mm -hmm. This, so this is Ida Cordoza and her presentation. I don't know if I can use this. Hi, my name is Aide Cardoza, and I'm going to talk about my experience attending the 2021 ASHA convention. Um, this is my first time attending the ASHA convention, so I didn't know what to expect, um, especially because it was going to be virtual. So I wasn't sure how I was going to get to my sessions, but um, once the convention started, it was pretty easy to follow along. So um, I got to join different sessions. But my biggest takeaway from this convention was um, that I need to get organized and I get to, I need to get prepared for it, um, the convention before the convention starts. Um, <laughs> it's hard for me to pick and choose what sessions to attend right there at the moment because there were um, many sessions going at the same time. So now I know that I um, if I look at the program before the convention, I'll be able to plan my sessions. Um, uh, and not miss any learning opportunities. So um, that was my biggest takeaway from this time. And now I know that um, in the future for any conventions that I get to attend, um, I'm going to get prepared for it and, and I'm going to plan my day or whatever sessions I want to attend and at what time I'm, I'll be attending those sessions. Another thing that I um, learned at this um, convention was that um, it is important for us to participate by asking questions. Uh, the presenters, they want to know uh, what questions we have. They want to hear comments. So that way they get um, better prepared and they know um, what um, they need to address in the future research projects or in their future presentations. Um, it's okay for us to ask questions to make comments and don't think that, oh, my question, um, it's very similar to the other question or my comment is about the same as the other person's comments. Um, it's okay for you to ask the question uh, and it doesn't matter if it sounds very similar to any other questions or any other comments. I also find out that there are a lot of resources out there for us. Um, the ASHA website is full of resources for us as students um, and as professionals. So um, go ahead and, and look up the ASHA website and explore the website and all the resources that they offer. And something that I really enjoy about this um, convention was um, the opportunity to connect with people who have the same interests and doubts as I do. Um, it was nice to see people working um, in research projects about uh, bilingual children and the methods and techniques that we use with them. So I was really excited when I got to join those sessions. Um, also, um, if you have the opportunity to join the ASHA convention in the future, please do. Um, it's only going to help you to grow your um, professional network and to get connected with other professionals um, across the country. So um, just I encourage you to 
uh, please take advantage of these conventions and join the conventions in the future. Um, I know I really enjoy this convention and I'm looking <coughs> forward for the next year convention. So um, I hopefully I get to see some of you at the convention and it's more in person and not only uh, virtual. Um, thank you. And that was my uh, biggest takeaway from this convention. Um, get organized, uh, participate and get connect with other professionals. Thank you. Hi, my name. Hi, Dave. Virtual. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you, everyone who came, um, both in person and virtually. Uh, we so much appreciate our students, and you really got to have some very unique experiences. I hope you really realize that. Um, I'm a little jealous, personally. <laughs> um, so, yeah. Uh, thank you for a wonderful semester. And again, congratulations on yeah. graduating in a week-ish. Um, we're very proud of you and very excited for you and know that you have good things going on in the future. Thanks, Thanks everyone.